And this, the, the other part is, uh, as always, we will ask you to ask. So please, please be active. Um, please use the Q&A function. I think uh, Aunt probably will will um, will come back to the questions towards the end of the talk. Uh, but please ask your questions uh, along the way. So our speaker today is Aunt Berge Salberg. Aunt Berge is a senior scientist, sorry, a senior research scientist at Norwegian Computing Center or Norsk Regne Central for the Norwegians. Um, his research contributions include use of image processing, machine learning, and data fusion techniques in a, a wide range of, of remote sensing applications. And in particular, his re research has been focused on developing deep learning methodology to analyze remote sensing images. And, and myself also listened to you on, uh, on Monday, Antbere, when you gave a tutorial, um, uh, and it was very good. So I'm, I, I look forward to this, uh, this session today. And today, the, the topic of this talk will be deep learning in, in Earth observations. So over to you, Antbere. Thank you. Let me see if we can start this up now. Um... was easy. Uh, it's missing. Let's try one more time. Uh, suddenly the everything was fine, but now we realize that we see it. There we go. Interesting. Here we are. Okay, okay failed now. <laughs> I don't know why. Try this. I know it fails when I try to launch the PowerPoint. <laughs> but nothing is easy. So let me try one more time. <laughs> and it's not Friday the 13th. <laughs> no. All right. Let me see. Now try that one. And try two. I think we're talking. Should be working. Okay. Can everyone see this now? Yeah, looking good. Okay, good. Great. Yes. Uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, about webinar. Um, yeah, the, the talk will be on deep learning in observation uh, and a little, little bit focused on what we have been doing here at the Norwegian Computing Center. Um, so um, at the NR, Norwegian Computing Center, we, we do data analysis for sure. Uh, every kind of data analysis from statistical modeling to machine learning and also recently, or well, not recently, we have been doing deep learning methodology since it was before it was called deep learning actually. And Earth observation has been one of the application areas where we have, have used it for. Um, um, yeah, just to start, I will just talk a little bit of what Earth observation is. Uh, go into some tasks that we try to solve and what kind of deep learning techniques we use to, to, to address that. And um, we discuss some of our, mention some of the projects we have, have applied it to. And in the end, we will also mention some of the, the challenges uh, that you will face typically uh, that you try to, to use deep learning or any of machine learning technique actually uh, to, to solve these, these, these problems. So, um, yeah, Earth observation uh, is about gathering information about the planets. It could be the physical, chemical, biological systems using remote sensing techniques. Um, at the section for, uh, for Earth observation, uh, we mainly focus on data from satellites, airplanes, or drones. Um, but then we also have projects we analyze seismic data, so we have a ship uh, serving the ocean. And all kinds of data are interesting for us, actually. So um, this is what observation. And to do that, there are several sensors that, that we, we, we apply. Uh, multispectral images is um, maybe the most used Earth observation sensor or remote sensing sensor, where we look at band or combinations of band that we can extract uh, specific information from, from the image. Um, it could be satellite data for airplanes and drones is the same method. So typically, the 
satellite data, resolution is from 30 centimeters to, to kilometers. So, so the, and for, for the aerial surveys, it's in centimeter range, 10.5 to 20 to 30 centimeters and drones, even finer. I mean, you can have very close up images. Um, yeah, this image I show here is from a satellite called Sentinel-2. Uh, it's a European satellite, it's free data. Uh, it contains 13 bands, um, the, the highest resolution of four of these bands are 10 meter. And yeah, you can extract various kinds of information from this. That in the middle is just a standard R RGB band. And yeah, to the left, I have did some combinations of other bands where you can enhance the specific features. I think this one enhances the agriculture areas. Yeah, the area here is, is uh, the Mjösa, the lake of Mjösa in Norway. So you can see that. Um, so this is the most popular thing the most look we can we can visualize it um, but there are other sensors that we look at as well and, and uh, particular synthetic aperture radar images and they are created based on, on sending a radar signal uh, down to, to the earth from the satellite uh, or the plane it could be and receiving that uh, the backscattering in energy so the, this scattered signals that we depend on the interaction between these microwave signals that we transmit and the surface. The benefit with this kind of sensors is that you can see through clothes. In particular for satellite data, that's very useful. Um, the resolution typically is one meter to 100 meter. I mean, this is great. Um, and there are different polarity that you, you, can, you can play with. So often they come at least with, with two polarizations. Um, and also wavelength, you can change that depending on the on the, on the SAR synthetic yeah, to radar sensor from from L band to to X band uh, in terms of frequency. Uh, this is an image from the Sentinel One, which is also a European satellite free of use. Uh, so um, and finally, one of the last sensors that uh, we we have the open study is LiDAR images, uh, which is just range measurements using laser. And uh, that basically provides you a high precision digital elevation model. So in Norway, for instance, there is a project going on where you're actually making an elevation model, digital elevation model using a lot of sensors from board airplanes. So I think most of the companies covered now, at least where, maybe except from the mountain regions. Yeah. And of course, you can use LiDAR and other uh, sensors for less. Want to, to monitor roads and stuff like that, you could put it on a, on a vehicle and drive it along with it. But you can also have it on airplanes, you can have oblique images like the one, the one to do the left. Yeah. But we, we basically look at uh, auto rectified images, uh, like in digital elevation model, or surface model, so you can extract heights of buildings and stuff like that. Yes, um, the tasks that we typically are interested in are the areas, the, the one of the most new tasks that we often end up with doing is land cover classification. Um, to create a thematic map uh, for a given time and area. So we take the, the image data that we have, and, and, and we, the task is to okay, figure out some thematic uh, categories for each pixels. So here, for instance, there is an image of Landsat 5 satellite uh, uh, over Hadongirvidda, and the task was is to create a thematic map of vegetation classes. You see the classes we have on the left, it's from rock, forest, mire, snow bed, and so on. Um, so this is often common, and we can get all kinds of thematic maps that we can create. And there exist a lot of these uh, worldwide now. Um, um, also, this connects it to, to changes in this. It's also another task that we are often interested in, figure out has the change. This is the deforestation going on. So on. So all these things we can do. Uh, another uh, just to off to use when we do this. Uh, another task is more parameter retrieval. So that could be to estimate a given parameter for each pixels in a given area. So not a thematic category, but you want to have a parameter. So here, for instance, we we have looked at snow parameters. It could be What's the fractional snow cover within a given pixel? What is the grain size of uh, the snow? 
this is no wetness and so on. So we have a long range of different snow parameters that we have worked on that we can extract from satellite data. And another thing could be like say, forest height, uh, forest uh, cover, stuff like that. So there are a lot of wide range of things. It could also apply to for, for, also, uh, for chlorophyll measurements in the lakes and ocean, all these things. Um, but yeah, this is our often used uh, task that is doing remote sensing. Um, then uh, object detection uh, is something we do. Um, where the image is simply to detect uh, objects in the image. Uh, for a given object, we're looking for a given object. Or you're looking for several types of objects in multiple categories them into to different ones. Um, so here is a very popular task, which is to detect ships from uh, SAR images. Um, today there are services for instance, uh, Comspers satellite services have a service on, uh, on this to detect ships uh, in Norwegian waters. Um, so, yeah, so we here we can see the ships are, are bright below. So we are, the aim is to identify them. And we have done similar tasks for detecting uh, seal pups resting on ice uh, in the ice outside of Greenland. And we want to classify them in two different species. We can do that same thing too. Yeah, and the last task I want to mention here is instant segmentation. So now we just also want to detect the object, but we also want to delineate it uh, in the image. So here is another, another example from SAR data, synthetic radar, uh, where we're we'll looking for oil spills. So the aim is to figure out where the oil spills and to detect them. And oil spills, in, and this is, a, you know, you, you, you're really relying on the backstage. Uh, Physical properties of the, back, the surface when in terms of the backscatter the energy. Um, the oil dampens the ripples on the surface and thereby it's more like a specular reflection. So you don't receive any energy uh, or less energy in where there's oil in the water. And thereby you, that appears black, dark regions in the image. So you can see here. So this, this in particular to the right of a huge oil spill. Uh, Long, long black. So typically a ship release this uh, when, when it's traveling. So whereas the, the, the area to the, to the left image is low wind pattern, which I'm not interested in detecting. So yeah, this is yeah, another task. Uh, but now we want to delineate it so they can measure the area of the oil spill and then figure out on some great statistics for it. So to do this task, uh, we, be, we often use convolutional neural networks and, and, or architecture based on convolutional neural networks. Um, and that has been a revolution in computer vision. Uh, started there, uh, I think in 2012 was when they really kicked off and when they, they won this ImageNet competition with this AlexNet. And everyone in computer vision jumped into uh, CNNs, computer convolutional neural networks, uh, to solve their, their problems. And the reason for it was quite simple. I mean, it performed much better than the, the standard techniques that present at that time. And since then, it, the performance has just improved even more. Uh, for instance, in recognizing images, they are often term the level is soft, it could be comparable to what humans are able to do. Uh, but I still recognize that humans are better, but, but yeah, so but it has vast improvements. And, and this has also been applied in, in Earth observation, remote analyzing, remote sensing data. And, and we started immediately on when this happens, you do the that NR as well. So, uh, yeah, convolutional networks, a little bit uh, I have on Monday, that uh, was mentioned in the introduction here. Um, it's just a concatenation of convolution operation, uh, filters, uh, activation with nonlinear activations, uh, and pooling layers. So, so if we start with an, an input image uh, and we filter them with a multiple set of filters. We apply to a railing operation, which means we have a linear unit, and then we take a new image, one for each response for each filter, and we do some pooling, because we could do pooling as well, and do another filtering, and so on and so on. Um, and, uh, and, and what we, the, the, the trick here is that these filters uh, are learnable parameters, and that's the, the, the whole machine learning task in, in this uh, convolutional neural networks. Um, the benefit of using filters is, is that you have fewer parameters in, 
and instead of connecting all pixels to, to, um, to every node in the hidden layer and so on in this neural network. So this is very beneficial uh, architecture. So another thing is that we are, if you look at this diagram here, you can see that we start with some image which have very few spatial channels, E1s, or, and, and a large uh, spatial coverage. We end up in something that has many channels and uh, it could be just one pixel. So we're trying to re-encode re information from a spatial distribution to something that has a channel distribution instead. So these are more suited for, for mapping into, uh, let's say, classification uh, image content, for instance. And there are variants of this uh, that we can exploit in order to, to do the task that we want to do, for instance, uh, sigma, the segmentation task or, or, or parameter retrieval. Um, yeah, what people do here is uh, in order to learn its weights, uh, we have a mathematical function and what we call loss function that compares the network output to the training data, which is the labels. We need ground truth data to, to solve this. So we send this input data to a neural network, we get a prediction and we compare that with the ground truth in the loss function and adjust the weights or the filters uh, of this convolutional neural network to, to match the uh, so that the loss is, is decreased. And this go on. So um, for a long time, we can train. Typically, it can take a day or something like that to train a new network. You know, it depends on the data and uh, the size of the data and the size of the network. Yes, um, in Earth observation, uh, we typically have a loss function that it depends on the task. So we have two, mainly two tasks. This is uh, classification, mapping, and regression, which is connected to this parameter retrieval. So when we do this uh, regression, we apply the mean square and loss function. We can use others, of course, but this is the most popular one. Uh, just measure, simply measure the distance between them. That's where we are. Uh, what we, if we do classification, we, we often use a cross entropy loss function uh, to do that. And if you want to do object detection, we have a combination of those two. We do the, the cross entropy for determining the class, the uh, class of the objects, and we use uh, our mean square error to do the regression of the bounding boxes. So, yes, so this is, I will not go into details because this is a lot of stuff to, to, to delve into, but uh, at least for detection parts, it's more complicated. So, inert observation, uh, when we do uh, pixel-wise semantic uh, mapping, the most common architecture is something called a unit. Uh, yeah. So the unit, the mini unit is because it's how you can, you can organize it as a U-shaped uh, network architecture. So you send in the image and you do two, two things. You, you do filtering on that and, and, and you send that to the output or, or uh, concatenate with other uh, layers. But you also will try to do the same stuff as I mentioned on the convolutional network. You're right. You do the, the filtering and you do the, uh, the nonlinear activation and you do the, the pooling to reduce the size and then you upsample it on the on the right hand side of the U and you do concatenation of all the layers and the end you have uh, something that can just take the information via multi layer uh, image for each pixel and try to do mapping based on that and everything is learnable from end to end this is highly beneficial and, and this works quite well. Uh, of course, when we have remote sensing images, they are quite large, and we cannot just put the whole image into a GPU because the, the memory on the GPU is not big enough. So, so we need to, to work on tiles and to map one tile at a time, preferably with some overlap in order to avoid edge effects and all these things. That's more engineering than science, so do that. Yeah. Yeah, we can another architect that we have worked on is going to mention because I have a very bright PhD student that's been doing that. He has done that something called Dense Validated uh, Convolution Merging Network, EDCM, which basically is doing the, he's doing the same thing as a map mapping, uh, but no, he relies, uh, this architecture relies on delayed convolutions in order to, uh, to, to have a, a big field of view of what you're seeing. And he's doing a merging of that in the end. So, so, it, it, yeah, I mean, his results are really so able to outcompete the, uh, the the unit on the, on the in terms of the performance. 
but but they both start. So if you want to start something and do this, I would just recommend start with a unit because if that uh, doesn't work, uh, there is something else that's going wrong. <laughs> so so or you have some something else that is bad, could be the date or whatever. So that's a good starting point. Um, they have also done used it to to do vegetation hate mapping. Uh, so uh, this is regression. We're doing this with retrieval. We want to estimate uh, the average vegetation height for each pixel. Uh, we had a project on that. But we developed the methodology. It was also based on the unit architecture with no in a regression fashion. Uh, what we ended up doing was mapping the vegetation height for the whole continent, our African continent. Um, that was quite huge, actually. It was 300 billion pixels, I think. Um, yeah, it's, we spent the Christmas back a few years ago to, 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 to do this. Uh, but it, it works. I mean, we are able to do that uh, quite efficiently. And um, in particular, since we only had training data from a few regions in Tanzania in order to, so it was hard. So to, a, lot, a lot of steps we need to solve so in order to, to fix this. Um, but overview, uh, general view of this is that it makes sense at least. Um, um, another task, uh, yeah, if you want to do detection, so the, the most popular architecture, uh, one of the most popular, uh, the two popular, uh, one is faster rising image, I'm not sure here, another one is YOLO, uh, which is another detection network. Um, but this is like a benchmark for the detection. The faster rising has probably a little bit uh, better performance, but a little bit slower. Um, this consists of uh, two, two networks here. There's the region proposal networks. This find regions in the object in the image where it can be the uh, the uh, the objects, and then we have this this region pooling layer, which takes all these, these proposals and map that into a smaller grid by grid pooling, and then we do classification for each of these objects in order to, to figure out which class they are. And if this is an object or not, so most of them are excluded actually as, as a background. So this is a very popular one and it's been used a lot. We have used it in Earth observation tasks as well. And then particularly one thing where we try to use coastal surveillance, where the aim is to do detect, uh, to develop an automatic solution, uh, for automatic, a solution for automatic analysis of the uh, images coastal surveillance. Uh, so an airplane flying on the coast. Um, and they are, they are creating movies uh, of what they're seeing, using a camera on board, and, and then we are working on developing a system where you can identify the ships, uh, if there are ships in the background or something else going on. So this is this is quite a cool, cool application. Yeah. So uh, if you want to do instant segmentation, uh, the mod, this can be used uh, often to so make sure it's something called mask RCNN, which is just an extension of this faster RCNN to, to but now tailor to solve an instant segmentation task. So it consists of the faster RCNN framework, but it also has a segmentation or automatic mapping network division uh, working in parallel. So not only to create the boning box, we can delineate the objects in the image. Um, we have an example where we have used that, and that is for traffic estimation, actually. Um, so um, the aim of that project was, it was to, to estimate uh, the traffic in urban areas uh, from remote sensing data. That is aerial images. Um, the reason we want to do that is that this is traffic estimates um, we have today, for many cities, exist only for a few road links, so parts of the road network. So here's, for instance, a uh, city in Nordic, in northern Norway, uh, where everything in purple has no traffic counts on, so no traffic estimation, where the red and, and the blue one has traffic estimates related to, to that. And that is the E6 road going through the city. Now, so what we want to do is to develop, can we use this aerial image to, to figure out a traffic estimate for the whole uh, city? So what we did then is, uh, we did that in some, which we had a few years ago called Equip, where we wanted to use that information for, for pollution. Uh, so they we work in the Met Norway and have a method of downscaling scaling this traffic estimation to for, uh, for figure out that the pollution impact. Fine grade pollution uh, 
So, uh, what we did here, we had this, this aerial photos. Uh, we had two or three photos for, for, each, uh, for different time instance of the ADL city. And we tried to detect all vehicles uh, in the we see um, in the images, and we use this mask as RCNN to, to find all of them. Uh, well, of course, when we do that, we find a lot of vehicles, um, also parked ones, yeah, and then and, and, and they should not come because of the parking. And, and that's easy for the for some of them. Uh, we, we have, of course, information about the road network, uh, but uh, people are often parked along the road. And that makes it much harder. So that was the, the main challenge in this, this project to exclude this. So um, what we did after we have this, this detected all these vehicles is to assign them to a road link. And then we estimate the traffic by using the number of vehicles and the speed limit there and, and the, the length of the road links to find the traffic flow through it. So assuming that they're driving at speed limit, of course, that is a huge, huge uh, assumption we are making. Which often is not uh, correct. Um, so we did that. Um, we figured out that well, it was quite noisy estimates because we only have snapshot of the traffic. So even if you have two or three images, it's not sufficient. So I mean that we're often left with, with road lanes with no vehicles, uh, and that's of course uh, not correct. Um, but we get uh, the count of a wide area. In addition, we had these ground-based traffic cones from, from, um, from stations in the road, could be loops that, or some, some inventory that, that uh, is installed at the roads that comes the vehicles. So we use that in, uh, to, for, for the roads the links that we have. We, road links where we have this, we used it. What we did now was to, to exploit the road network that is a graph uh, to improve the traffic estimates on the road links without ground measurements. So uh, what we did now, and we did that, um, doing some roads, some smoothing on the graph with constraints, with the uh, methodology for that. And we, we, we can compare it, and if you have well, it could a lot. The green one is the noisy uh, satellite uh, on an airplane, aerial photos with counted, and then the, the blue one here is uh, the high quality one. Uh, so we, we compared it back to using a lean one there, you know, even not connected. And the one is the proposed. Uh, we, we don't know the answer of the volume, but it, it is much, much better than the green one. Yes, so um, doing that, we can estimate the traffic of the whole city. That was the whole idea here. So um, well, this one, deep learning, was a key component because it provides uh, robust estimates of the number of cars in each road length. Uh, that was very, very important. Uh, without uh, that technology, we tried that before 10 years ago, we struggled a lot to do that. Uh, it was very difficult. So, there are a lot of challenges um, when doing um, Earth observation uh, uh, in, with um, deep learning. Um, the first is the annotation of the label data. Um, what we often see is that they are incomplete and the missing part it means that we, not the whole image is annotated, they have um, excluded some, some areas for annotation because they were bored or too difficult or, uh, yeah, I don't know, reasons a lot for not doing it. And um, maybe they didn't have a strategy. Remember, also they are not labeled for, in particular for machine learning. They are maybe labeled for other reasons. And it often be imprecise. I mean, Job. So here's a road uh, network uh, where we just have what the road network. We overlay the, the road, the existing road networks over the LiDAR images. And you can see well, it doesn't, there are, there are issues there. So using it as training data could be challenging. Uh, and we see that in often in many projects that this is the case. Uh, so if it's not complete, we need to know where is it annotated, for instance. Um, which or areas are excluded. And this is a challenge that we need to solve. Yeah. Another challenge uh, that we always encounter when you do this is class imbalance. Um, so if you have several classes, we want to, to find an image, 
One of them are frequent and the other could be rare. That goes particularly for vegetation mapping where we have rare species, highly abundant species. See. Um, so how can we train uh, a CMM um, with severe class imbalance? And then there are some approaches uh, we can try and is use class weights and cost functions. So we are weighting putting more emphasis on the uh, the classes with few labels uh, compared to the classes with a lot of labels. That's one way. There's a common way from something called medium frequency balancing that is commonly used. Um, but been, you can do it, uh, reinvent your own class weights if you want. Another strategy is to have some smart sampling schemes. So when you are doing uh, the deep learning, you often sample data in, in mini batches because you cannot fit the whole data set into the GPU. So you are sampling a batch, small batch of it. And you can make sure that uh, each mini batch has more or less an equal class distribution. Uh, that means you need to sample uh, the small classes more frequently uh, compared to the large ones. So you, you're doing that one. Uh, we can try to remove and add data. That's another way that you do it. Um, yeah, for instance, when you do the road segmentation, you see on the right here, uh, we have two classes is background and road. But nearly the whole image is background. And very few pixels are roads. So this means you have a severe class imbalance in this case. And if you didn't compensate for it, you'll probably not find any roads at all. And because the network will just choose the, the background class and it does very, very well. So how, you know, this goes also for the evaluation. Um, when you have severe class and imbalance, uh, do not use accuracy. Uh, for instance, the image here will probably have 99.1% the correct uh, classification by just selecting the background. So precision recall types is you know, F1 is better than, the, than the, the accuracy, even though you can report it, but at least you be careful. You know. Another thing that is you, you always find in remote sensing images is something called data set shift. Um, so maybe we collect training data where uh, we have a distribution of them, and uh, that could be from uh, one or several images or the use of training data. Uh, but often when we, we, uh, we try to apply this uh, for new data, in particular in a large scale scenario, uh, we often see that these data are, doesn't match the training uh, data distribution. Uh, it could be because it was created, uh, collected from a different area. So, or it could be that the uh, altitude, or uh, it could be that it was a different time of the year, and so on. So, the when you do the testing, the, this data distribution doesn't match anymore. So, that will lead to some degradation of the performance uh, of the test data. So, here's an example here where we typically. We, we, so this one is back to this, this Lancet firing of Hanamirida, where we collect data from, from the, uh, the summer range. And then if you try to do the classification uh, or mapping uh, using an autumn image, all of a sudden change. I mean, you have the technological cycle of the vegetation, and now the, the vegetation will become brown and yellow and doesn't look like it did in the summer or spring, for instance. So, there's something you need to, to keep in mind. And there are a lot of other applicated things, and this will always happen. And you, often you cannot see it, but the computer figures it out. This doesn't work well. And um, show it in terms of degraded, with degraded performance. Um, so this is um, really a bottleneck to solve. And the bad thing is that there's no golden solution to, to fix this. Um, you need to really understand the problem. Data and the problem and why it's like so. Of course, you can try to collect more data, making sure to increase the distribution of, of the, the training data so it captures a more high variety of, of the outcome. And you can try to do a data augmentation techniques. That could also help a little bit if you try to alter the training data. Um, you could be resizing them, you could slightly, you can, you can adjust the contrast, add some noise, a lot of things you can try to do in order to make the distribution more so, so bigger, so to speak. Um, 
Another more advanced technique is something called domain adaptation strategies. Um, and they could work, uh, you, but then you need probably you need some domain knowledge uh, also. Uh, and there are different ways to do this. Uh, many of them are based on these general yeah, these adversarial networks, which may work or may not. Uh, it depends. Um, but there are no, I'm going to say there's no, no big benchmark technique in this area either. So this is a research, hot research topic going on. And maybe a fourth thing to do is uh, semi-supervised learning, where you have unlabeled data from the test uh, domain and include that in the training. You know, right? So that could be another strategy that could work. If they are close, it, it may help. If they're too far away, it, it may not work. So but that's not a strategy that, that I recommend. But of course, you don't know the labels of the training data, the uh, test data. So it's, it's hopefully, mm -hmm able to connect it to the training data, but, I, but it's not a guarantee either. Yes, um, so another challenge that we have is there's a need to model context or, or some physical constraints, so to speak, uh, the context here in this case here. So here we have did a project a few years ago where we tried to map roads from weather data, and, and um, that worked well, quite well in terms of the performance matrices that we were able to create. They were based on the, the pixel wise uh, accuracy, not accuracy, but could be a precision recall. And uh, what we figured out when we looked at the data in the prediction is that the, the roads were not connected to each other. Uh, so there were the gaps between them because for some reason the network thought, well, this is no road here. And, and that was strange because you know that road network is connected. You barely are missing 10 meters of road and then it starts again. Uh, so these are things that is hard to include into a deep learning model, which are pixel based. This is one of the drawbacks. That it has no knowledge about that things are, have a certain structure or context and stuff like that. It only knows about pixels. And um, yeah, so there's an, definitely a need to do to do this, uh, make, make things work. And so you, if you try to do something like this, you often end up that uh, strange thing can happen, things that you didn't expect, even though that the performance metrics that you apply are, are quite good uh, when evaluating. Um, yeah, so this is a need. Um, another need that is to incorporate physics. I mean, this is uh, many models already are physical based, and, and it could be. This is here we have the snow monitoring. And there is a physical constraint between these products. Um, I mean, if the fractional snow cover is zero, I mean, there's no need to create, I mean, the snow wetness and snow rain chart should, should also be zero, not calculated. I mean, this doesn't make sense. These are a lot of things that we can do to, to use the physics into this network. It's not easy. Um, there's so many variations of the physics and, and, and how it encounters we apply it and what we have and what we know. And um, so it's not, um, and how to build that into the architecture is not easy. Um, so this is uh, another challenge that we need to do. Uh, yeah, uh, pretty much end of my talk, I think. Um, so yeah, this is the conclusion. So what we have to say here is that uh, deep learning can solve problems. Uh, we could not solve 10 years ago, that's for sure. And uh, the performance is a much, higher number than we had, and it's often easier to do it. We, uh, years ago, we needed to spend a lot of time engineering features uh, to make it, figure out something, good features to describe the image, or the content of the image, and then apply those features into classify. This step has been included now into the learning, the learning model, so it's much easier. Uh, however, it's not more intelligent than the training, the training that we create, and it's highly dependent on the training data. And this is the most important thing in designing networks is training data. So this is where I um, you often, if it doesn't work uh, good enough, it's often related to training data or, or some lack of it or persistent of it. And there are still a lot of challenges uh, to be solved, uh, in particular the one that we mentioned in the end. And uh, this is something that we will do in the future. We have recently. Uh, 
other than SFI, called Visual Intelligence, together uh, with the University of Tromsø, which is leading this, and the University of Oslo, where the aim is to solve all these challenges we have with image data, context modeling, including physical constraints, data sets, challenges with that, uh, the main adaptation, all things we can think of. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we will be able to do this much better in the coming years. Uh, Yes. Okay. Um, that's it. I'm open for questions. Well, uh, thanks for thanks for the presentation. Uh, very interesting, I think. So, people, please ask uh, ask your questions in the Q and A. We have uh, we have received a few questions. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one is, is is kind of general, so I think you have to you know you'll find a way to answer it in a general way as well. <laughs> uh, it says, how long will it take to train the CNN for a typical task? And how accurate is the classification or the regression problem? That's a general question. Uh, it could be everything at the answer. Uh, well, there are many, many things that, uh, for training. And the first thing is, OK, um, what's the size of the network you have you have chosen to use? And that impacts. If you have a small network, it runs much faster than a big network. That means how many parameters. Another thing is how big is the data set uh, we have to use. Um, one thing, um, uh, and in terms of what is part of the data set, the bigger data set you can expect better performance in order to achieve that, you need to train longer uh, until it starts to get uh, overtrained and then the performance doesn't improve anymore. And the, the last thing that's also very important is what kind of hardware do you have? And one thing is the GPU. Uh, of course, if you have a very old GPU, it takes longer time and you have less memory on it. So you need to, to have a need to sample often, often from, from the disk instead of this, and all these things. And the next thing is the hardware drive. And so that's the two things we need to do. And that depends, of course, if you have a very small data set, it can just be on the disk that you have on the computer. If it's like a standalone computer, if it's a big, uh, big data set, you may uh, install an extra hardware I mean, storage on the data. So, and that needs to be fast. That impacts a lot. Uh, for instance, I recently, I think yesterday, I mounted a new drive on my computer that I had under my desk here, and that was an NVMe drive, something like very fast, four terabyte. And before that, I tried to use, to have the data set stored in a network at work. And the performance is 10 times faster now. But we're just doing that. So that's something that's very important. And the performance, it depends on the quality uh, of the labeling, of how is the, good is the data annotated, and how does, how, uh, yeah, what's the task you have? How difficult is it? Is it easy for a human to, to, uh, to do this in a second or two of the task? You can expect the network to solve it quite well uh, and quite good, actually. If you, if you do it properly, the setup. But if, this, that, if it's hard for a human to figure it out, uh, maybe this is not the process that you want to automate in the beginning because you cannot expect to, to apply performance uh, immediately, uh, at least if you don't have a, a very smart way of doing it. Huge domain law knowledge. I don't know if I answered the question, but it's very hard to say. I mean, we, for ImageNet, they do, uh, let's say, four to five percent uh, accuracy in terms of top five classification, and which is uh, but typically it's over 95 percent for the, the task we apply here, an average. And of course, that depends. I mean, the average class per class average, not, not the aggregate total. Average. Yes. Did I it's, answer? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a good answer. And at, at least you give you know give a flavor of what this is about. And I think that's. Uh, you don't that's, you that's... don't put the data on another place in the network. That's a, not a good idea. Mm -hmm. that's and, a... and maybe we can also advocate. Um, we've, we, there, there's an application out for um, a national infrastructure for machine learning that hopefully will, mm -hmm. you know, help more people work mm -hmm. on these kind of problems without having the computer under their own desks. We'll you see how that goes. If you want to start, uh, Google has a code world environment where you can do this and you can also yeah. have access to GPUs. So you can play a lot. Sure. 
Okay, there's one question here about uh, could you say a few words about model acceptance criteria, for example, for land cover classification problem? And can you compare, are there any comparisons to human experts? So how do humans you know, compare on those kind of tasks? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, the model acceptance. I don't know sure what he actually meant by that, but there has been comparison of models uh, to do tasks. And of course, it depends on the task. Uh, my PhD student of mine, he did a comparison a few years ago for this, uh, showing how they are aligned. They do often do quite good, all of them. And, and it depends on the person that did it. They often have a favorite one that they spend more time training. So that's they will often work better. Um, and um, sorry about that. And uh, so look at survey papers and uh, stuff like that. And if you want to figure out, there are a little bit becoming more and more of them. And what was the last part of the question? Uh, Comparing that to human, you know, human. Yeah, the human. Yeah, that's what we do when we, when we create the statistics here. Um, and then do the training. The training data is to some degree created by human. Uh, and uh, of course, then the humans are often labeled that in images themselves. It could be a very, very high resolution image. They sit there and draw polygons around what they do. And that's the way to label the data. Um, so they're not, not all data from field surveys. So of course there's uh, always a mismatch there. Um, but yeah, I guess humans are better, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, so and, but let's say you do, so that you do in 90, 90% accuracy of compared to human, I guess, something like that. I don't know. It's very hard to say. It depends on the task and how difficult it is. So it's very, very difficult to give a specific number. But, uh, a a follow-up on that one, Ant, but, uh, um, you, you sh in your presentation, you showed, uh, you showed some, I think it was satellite data with sm some small, you know, white, um, objects and you yep. you you said they were ships yeah uh, i couldn't i couldn't tell that was a ship no and that's <laughs> that is uh um, um there are humans identifying it and, and often when they do training there for that they, they're connecting the, to the uh, ais on board of ship to figure out where it is so that's the, the way they can do it of course and then they have long experience with it so they know what the ship looks like and all these things but of course to be absolutely true they should have some very, very high resolution image simultaneously optical mm. to say this is the ship, but uh, yeah, so that's the, that's difficult. And there will always be cases where it is, but this is the, an expert. So the one you have experts labeling the data, like say for medicine, it's not for uh, for us to do to figure out where the cancer cells are. I mean, there are you have trained experts to do this task. I suppose. But they you know. Well, so so this is to say the compared to humans, I mean, you need to compare it with having several humans and then you put your methodology in and see how, it, how does you, does it work? Hmm. Are you biased compared to them? Hmm. Good. Um, how about this one? How about uncertainty specifically for rapid processes in high latitudes, combining satellite images uh, where one is more outdated than the others, I suppose? So taking that two different times, how do you take that into account? Uh, I didn't understand what 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 should we use the uncertainty? Uh, what is the uncertainty? Um, if maybe I, Ekaterina, maybe Mariana, you could uh, could you open her microphone? She can ask. Yeah, thank you. Ekaterina is here from Department of Marine Technology. So we don't really work with satellite data, but we just observe what's happening there. And so usually when it comes to the satellite uh, images, they're taking at a different time. So when you combine it uh, for, this, uh, for a larger re uh, region, one image will be more outdated than another one. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking, for example, for a rapid process, I'm not talking about the forest grows slowly, so it doesn't really matter. But when you talk about, for example, uh, ship traffic or ice areas, the situation can rapidly change within the hours. And it means that in your analysis, uh, some information which is presented for the analysis will be more outdated than another one. So mm. how then uh, and if you take this into account or you just uh, simply classify it and then you don't really kind of care how people use it or do you also present this information together with the classification? 
Uh, I'm not working with these kind of data at the high latitudes, but uh, but I can see that that will be for all ch fast changing processes. But what do you typically do? Let's say if you do oil spill detection, that's uh, one of these things that then will evaporate uh, soon. And you, you connect just con using um, when you are providing the data with a label or tag saying when was this? That's it. So, uh, so that you, you cannot build up a huge map of well, this is the status at that time because you cannot do it. So I don't know if that answered the question, but so you, you're using that as instant time information for, for, for that area. So it has, has uh, it, 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 uh, it will change. And uh, the one who users of these kind of services, they know it. So that's what I say. Um, the, for, the, the good thing about being in the hard, High latitude is that these satellites are often um, they are going in polar or orbits. So the um, there, this area in the north is very very frequent monitor compared to areas at the equator, uh, for instance. So they, they often have a lot of satellite passes uh, every second hour in that area. So so, so or even far more. So that's the benefit. Mm. Thanks. Uh, let me just check time. Yeah, we have still time for a few more. Um, let's, uh, there's a question here on, on time series analysis. For example, for radar data, snow storage. Um, have you applied these kind of, of, of methods? I suppose uh, deep learning on, on um, those kind of data? Yeah, um, what we did for the forest, for instance, was using time series to, to figure out uh, the changes. That's something we did. Uh, we are now working with snow. Uh, we have a deep learning project on that, where we, we uh, the plan is at least, yeah, we do it to some degree time series analysis in deep learning process, but we do often do it as post-processing and stuff like that. And, and we have the previously included in Marco models and all these things per pixels in order to, to model uh, the time, um, time series. Um, of course, in this deep learning, in that will be probably used on some uh, uh, recurrent neural network if you want to do that. But I'm not sure if it will give you the answer that you want, but yeah, that's what people have been doing. So um, it's a little bit immature still for deep learning uh, to have a Time, time dimension as well, but it's possible. No, I don't know who, who asked this question, mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, I could also... But that that will uh, become more and more because, yeah. So what now, when it's satellite data, when it's Sentinel satellites, this European one, I show example from, they are tailored for time series analysis because they only provide acquisition in a specific setting. So they don't change it. Uh, so if you have a, a radar satellite for, from others, they, they can change the, the acquisition modes, the, the angles and how it looks and stuff from continuously. But these are only fixed. That's a good thing because then you have operational data that you really, really can create time series. From. So, hmm. uh, what I wanted to say is uh, there's, a, there's a new project that NTNU in time series, uh, irregular time series, machine learning for irregular time series. Mm -hmm. So if anyone's interested, um, please reach out. We'll see if we can connect you. A question on multispectral images uh, to, for instance, to, to do pixel wise mapping. Do you use images from all the channels or do you um, only use one? Uh, no, we often use a subset of channels. Uh, for instance, Sentinel-2, there are some channels that are tailored to clothes and stuff like that, uh, serious clothes that we didn't apply and also have a lower resolution, 60 meters. So three of the channels have 60 meter resolution and through four have 10 and the remaining is 20. So we're using everything higher than 20, 20 and higher for that. So that's typical. And you often, if you do use a Landsat satellite, you're a little bit careful using the thermal band for vegetation mapping because it's not that connected. So yeah, mm. it depends. Uh, it depends on so some bands and may, and often you try to have as few as possible in order to solve the task that will be the best thing. Very good. And then we have, I think this is a nice uh, questions to, to question, sorry, nice question to round it off with. 
it's again from Ekaterina asking, are you putting these models in productions, in, sorry, in production? And, and do you have any lessons learned in terms of easing the transition between development and development and production? Uh, good question. I have not been the one who has done that. There's all, others has worked. Um, yeah, I mean that <laughs> this not being too consistent on that, but there are some issues. You need yeah, there with data and all these things, and you need to make sure that you you have data book. And in the they are fast enough. That has been a problem. For instance, not for the Earth observation, we've done that uh, on seismic data. And uh, then we really, really need to think about tra training it. I mean, then it's a production actually to train also. Uh, and then we, we, how should that be performed? Uh, the the res bits, resolution, all these things we are played along with memory consumption, disks, and all these things that matter. Um, yeah, so this is. Uh, I, mm, what I will say, uh, I think that otherwise I'm quite surprised. I mean, how fast it often is to just to apply the model. Uh, but in production, I mean, then you, the system around is also important. At least for Earth observation, you need to have a way to ensure that you get the data and they're downloaded and, uh, and run and all these things. And that's, yeah, also important. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. But so there are at least. Depends on the kind of framework we are using. PyTorch, they don't have yet a specific production environment. They're starting to get this just in time thing that they use. But yeah. Normally, we are, we are not experienced that much issues with it, except from, from having storage for the data and all these things that we need to have. And make sure that the GPU is, is close to the the disks and all these things. And, uh, and let's say also another one when we're working with this, uh, have a way to read the images fast is also important. So you don't have a reader that takes a long time. So maybe you need to reformat the, the image data. So, so. There are a lot of issues, some, some things going on there. Yeah, it needs, it needs a certain level of maturity, I suppose, before you... Yeah, it is. It's still going on. This, but, uh, yeah. Very good. Thanks for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, lots of good examples. Uh, uh, lots of hands-on experience, I think we can, can tell from your, the way you describe it. So thanks, uh, thanks for uh, coming and, and speaking to us. And thanks to everyone for, uh, for joining. And uh, I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.